Hi everyone, welcome into Maisie Days with Amanda and Randy. Mays, we made it to our second episode. Can't believe it, very honored. But today you've traded in your baseball uniform for another piece of apparel. I'm wearing my WV fly fishing shirt. I'm a fly fisherman, so if any listeners out there got a nice stream and you need a buddy, here I am. Always working the fishing angle. All right, let's talk baseball. Charlotte this weekend, another two and two performance. The last game, can I say, was a kick in the balls. Are you allowed to say that? I can't. I can say whatever I want. Yeah. Gosh. Well, thanks for reminding me. I was just starting to forget about it. <laughs> and here you go. But yeah, it was a fun weekend. You know, this time of the year, you care more about how good your team is uh, in the early season rather than a bad inning or a mishap here and there. So left that week weekend thinking that we we dominated all four games, I thought, and we're definitely the better team. And that's still without J.J. and without Brody Kresser, who was injured as well, who was J.J.'s backup. So we're, we're that team that's playing with their number three quarterback in the bowl game, but we're still winning. So I'm leaving there super, super encouraged uh, about the team. But on a side note, I did learn something this weekend on a personal side note. <laughs> my, the, are you scared? A little bit. As you know, my back has been sore again. And are you really going to tell this? Our bus driver, <laughs> a, an old dude from New York, saw me struggling to get on and off the bus. He said, "Coach," he said, "This might sound funny, but have you ever tried to take my doll for your back?" <laughs> I can't believe you're going to say this. I was like, "No, I didn't." He said, "You should try it. It worked for me." So I can proudly say, as I sit here, that I took two Midol pills on Sunday before the game, and my back actually felt better <laughs> after taking two Midol pills. My stomach felt better. Your back felt better. Well, I mean, I was irritable and mad at everybody and yelling at people. Is that a side effect of Midol? <laughs> it sure. No, seems it's supposed like to calm it. that down. It's supposed to calm that down. Oh yeah, so. As we sit here doing this podcast today, I took my mite all this morning, so I'm feeling okay right now. <laughs> oh, my so God. Thank I, you for that. Yeah. Well, you can thank the bus driver. I can only imagine the response to that, but that's that's what this podcast is all about, right? Like, we're honest about everything. I'm that guy. I'm not afraid to carry your purse through the mall when you have to go to the restroom. But exactly. I have my pre-programmed responses to the people who are going to ask me about it, but I'm not afraid to be that guy. You are not afraid to be that guy. Home opener this week, hopefully if the weather cooperates, then on the road again, Western Kentucky, really getting into the thick of things right now. Yeah, you know, these four-game weekends, man, they really test your pitching staff, and we still have a couple guys, really important guys, who are out with injuries, so we're being tested pretty good right now, which is why I'm encouraged about this team when we get some of our guys back to add to what appears to be a pretty good team, then I'm still pretty excited about this season and everyone else should be too. And another personal fact that a lot of people don't know, you know why we eat pork on New Year's Eve, right? Do you know that story? I do know that story. You eat pork on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, forgive me for all you listeners who are about to uh, DM me and correct what I said. (laughs) Uh, good luck DMing me, by the way. That, that'll that never work out for you. But we eat pork on New Year's Day because hogs and pigs, when they dig, only dig forward. And they're always making progress when they dig. So you eat pork on New Year's Day as a sign of progress. So after what appeared from the outside to be a terrible loss yesterday, I'm going to eat my pork today. And I'm going to tell our team the story of the pork on New Year's Day in our team meeting tomorrow. And we're just going to continue to move forward. That's kind of what we do. Can we talk about the fan support? Great fan support opening weekend at Stetson. Charlotte was amazing. If there weren't equal or more Mountaineer fans in the stands, they were loud. They were vocal. 
I met a lady, a wonderful lady, who it was her first game. So it was really exciting to have all those fans in the stands because Mountaineers, they travel well. And in Charlotte, they were all over the place. Yeah, that was cool. We had probably as many, if not more, fans than they did. And that's a great area for us. It's within driving distance. And there were a lot of Mountaineers in the Carolinas. And just to see all those people up there cheering for the Mountaineers, I think they would all say the same thing that I said, that aside from one bad inning – Uh, We outplayed them in the other, however, 32 innings we played. So I think all the fans that came and watched us left there thinking, looks like the Mountaineers got a chance to be pretty good this year. Saw some former players. Former teammates of mine. Yeah, all all over the place. You've had former teammates at your first two opening weekends, Um, guys from your hometown, guys you coached, um, Zaidi. KC. So that was pretty exciting to see those guys and catch up. Yeah, all those guys. Uh, uh, Todd Neff, one of our great supporters, a former player that lives down in the Carolinas. He had another former player with him yesterday, and I didn't get to meet that former player because Todd said, I didn't look too happy walking to the bus after the game yesterday, so he didn't want to bother me. So shout out to Todd. Thank you for that. (laughs) Because who knows how that would have gone in the heat of the moment. But, uh, yeah, awesome to see all those people. And when I see one of my former teammates that's my age, and I think they're really starting to look old, what do they say about me? That's what I wonder. aging backwards, honey. Don't worry about that. Am I like a fine bottle of wine? Is that what you're saying? (laughs) Yes. Yep. You're aging in reverse. You don't look a day over 25. Well, just lock, Times two lock me in the wine cellar in the basement and leave me there for 30 years, see how good I am at age 87. There you go. So seeing Zaidi and KC got me thinking, what are some of your favorite player stories from your days here at WBU? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, there are, there are so many, but let me preface all that by saying I'm a guy that likes to give people opportunities to thrive. Let me take you back to my Clemson days when I first started coaching. This is a story that has kind of molded me into the coach that I am. This is a two-part story. So if you're on your way to work right now listening to this, this may take a little while. So take your foot off the gas pedal, take your time. This is the story of Jeff Morris and Steve Harris, uh, one of which you know, Mm -hmm. the other one you don't. Jeff Morris was a little second baseman from Pittsburgh, from Upper St. Clair, Pittsburgh. My first year of coaching at Clemson, Jeff Morris tried to walk on the Clemson baseball team. And Jeff was really small. He weighed about 140 pounds. He was really weak, undersized, underdeveloped. He could run just a little bit. But his arm strength was really, really lacking. And But he was a great kid and a really hard worker. And the coach that I coached for, a guy by the name of Bill Wilhelm, He was about 100 years old when I met him, so by the time I coached for him, he was well into his later years. I was coaching on that staff when Jeff Morris tried to walk on the team. And myself and the other two coaches, Dave Littlefield and Joel Leppel, went to Coach Wilhelm one day and said, we need to cut Jeff Morris. He's just not good enough. If he ever makes this team, we suck. Let's be honest. (laughs) He's just never going to be good enough. And Coach Wilhelm said, I'm not in any hurry to cut this kid. He's a great kid. He's an unbelievable worker. He loves baseball, and he loves Clemson. So let's just give the kid a chance. So we kept him that first year, and we redshirted him that year. And he just filled in in some inner squads and got in the weight room, got a little bit stronger, got a little bit faster, still could never throw very well. His arm action was really bad, and... But he stuck around that first year, and then we started the fall of his red shirt freshman year. And about a couple weeks into practice, all the coaches went to Coach Wilhelm again and said, Coach, please cut Jeff Morris. We're throwing batting practice to him. We're wasting time, taking away from what the other players could do. He's never going to play for us. And we finally talked to Coach Wilhelm into cutting Jeff Morris. And after practice one day, I was sitting on the bench next to Coach Wilhelm, and he called Jeff over there, and he said, Jeff, he said, I can't even tell you how much I appreciate the effort you've put into making this team. He said, but it's just never going to happen. He said, I can't sleep at night knowing that I'm asking you to put in all these hours and lifting and study hall and practice, 
and it's never going to happen for you. You're just never going to be good enough to make this team, so I'm going to have to let you go now. And Jeff Morris looked Coach Wilhelm right in the eye when Jeff was 18 years old and said, Coach, please don't cut me. He said, I just love being out here. I love the guys on the team. They've become my best friends. I promise I won't get in the way. I'll chase foul balls. I'll do what you need to do. If somebody gets hurt, I'll fill in. I just love coming out here every day. And that day, I can't remember what year it was. must have been about 1990. Jeff Morris, the 18-year-old, talked to Coach Wilhelm, the Wiley veteran, out of cutting him from the team. And Coach Wilhelm left him on the team. And believe it or not, Jeff Morris' last two or three years at Clemson, he was our starting second baseman every day, and he hit a walk-off grand slam to win the ACC tournament against NC State. And please don't cut me, Coach. That's all he had to say. And Coach Wilhelm just gave him the opportunity to shine. And that's just an amazing story to me, and, and I've tried to do that in my career, give kids opportunities. So rarely, though, you get to take a story like that and use it in real time. So here comes part two of the story. When I was the head coach at Charleston Southern, I had a kid on the team named Steve Harris, another kid from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And Steve was on my team at Charleston Southern. I didn't recruit him. He was in the incoming class when I became the head coach there at age 27. And Steve Harris was a really, really hard worker. He couldn't throw either. And he swung and missed all the time, really hard worker, but it was never going to be the case that he was going to play. So we redshirted Steve Harris that first year, let him get in the weight room. But at the end of that year, I left Charleston Southern and took a job at the University of Georgia. And Steve Harris wanted to come with me. He wanted to play at Georgia because I went to Georgia. I said, Steve, you can't play at Georgia. Can't even play at Charleston Southern. So you just need to stay here and hopefully fight your way into the lineup. So they hired a new coach at Charleston Southern, and Steve Harris didn't like him, didn't feel like he got the right opportunity. And at the end of that season, he called me and said, Coach, I hate it here. I got to get out of here. He said, what should I do? I said, do this. I said, the head coach at Western Carolina is a good friend of mine. I promise you he'll give you an opportunity He won't cut you. He'll give you an opportunity for your work ethic to shine through. And I called the coach at Western Carolina and I said, hey, you got a guy transferring in named Steve Harris. When you first look at him, you're not going to like him. You're going to think he's a bad player. Give the kid a chance. I said, he's going to grow on you. His work ethic, his personality are infectious. Give the kid a chance to show you what he can do. He said, okay. I got you, Maze. I'll give him a chance. So that fall semester started. Two days into practice, Steve Harris called me and said, Coach, I got cut. Second day. I'm like, oh, my God. I I convinced this kid to go up there because he was going to get an opportunity to play. And then he got cut. So I thought, okay, let me, let me use this Jeff Morris story, see if this actually can really happen. I said, Steve, go to the coach at Western Carolina and say, Coach, please don't cut me. I won't get in your way. I'll chase foul balls. I won't I won't take up any of your time. If somebody gets hurt, I'll fill in. I don't need to travel. I transferred in here to play. Just give me an opportunity. And wouldn't you know it, during Steve Harris, talked that coach into putting him back on the team and doing exactly that, not getting in the way, just filling in when he can. And when Steve Harris told me he was back on the team, I'm like, this whole thing, thing might be real, this giving kids opportunities. Steve Harris, to this day, holds the career home run record in the Southern Conference. He hit 26 homers as a senior at Western Carolina. Please don't cut me, coach. And that's the moral of the story. People with opportunities can do unbelievable things. How many people are there out there that never got the opportunity to show what they're capable of doing? So, if anyone out there is still listening to this story, and <laughs> oh, I have I'm awake. My, I'm awake I, now. I have my doubts, but if anybody is still <laughs> listening to this story, if you manage people or are around people, give people an opportunity to show what they can do. Or maybe it's you. Maybe you need the opportunity to show what you can do. But the common denominator with Jeff Morris and Steve Harris were the work ethic and the desire. So... I'm not just saying give that opportunity to everybody. Those guys earned that opportunity by their work ethic 
and their desire and their willingness, their hard work. So if somebody in your life puts forth effort into something that you're trying to do, give them the opportunity to to thrive. And I've always tried to use that in my career with kids. Number one, they have to be the right type of kid. But if you ever have anybody in your organization that is trying their hardest to make your team or your organization better, give that person an opportunity to shine because there's no telling what they can do. Those are amazing stories. And obviously, I feel like that's a different kind of maybe kid these days. It's, it's a little harder in this day and age of I can just transfer. We're kind of molding our kids when they're younger to quit a team and find another team if they're not, they're not playing hard. So how does that transfer that message into this day and age? Well, you know, it's that's the basic backbone of coaching is – we have a kid on our team right now. Skylar King came to us because his high school coach was a teammate of mine at Clemson. And uh, my buddy called me and said, hey, I got a pretty good left-handed pitcher down here. He plays the outfield for me too, but I think his future is as a left-handed pitcher. His name is Skylar King. So we signed Skylar and signed him as a left-handed pitcher and gave him an opportunity to hit because he's a great kid. He's an unbelievable kid. So much fun to be around. Great personality. As we sit here today, after two weekends, Skylar King is leading our team in hitting. And he came here as a left-handed pitcher. So once again, kids with opportunities, if they're the right type of kid, can do amazing things. But somebody has to give them that opportunity. And I learned that from Coach Wilhelm 35 years ago sitting in the dugout with Jeff Morris, that the right kid deserves an opportunity. You'd be surprised what they're capable of. How exciting is it when these kids prove you wrong or prove that they can do something that maybe you couldn't see or didn't know when they get on campus? Well, the thing that's changed, Coach Wilhelm motivated me by telling me I couldn't do it. My sophomore year at Clemson, I wasn't playing. I didn't play much as a freshman I only got 30-some at-bats and only pitched, you know, 30 innings, something like that. I was a two-way guy. Going into my sophomore year, I wasn't playing again. And I grabbed Coach Wilhelm one day in left field. I'll never forget it. And I said, Coach, what do I got to do to break into the lineup here? Just tell me. And he said, Mays, he said, if you were an everyday player at Clemson, if you were in the lineup every day, your batting average would be under 200. That's how bad you are. I was a little bit taken aback by that. And he said, um, Mays, I, I apologize. I should have never said that. He said, let me let me rephrase that. Your batting average would be under 100. Ouch. Yeah. And I thought, all right, you big SOB. <laughs> Give me an opportunity. And I told him out there, I said, Coach, I promise you, I promise you, you give me an opportunity, I'll show you you're wrong. And the next day, that's the way Coach Wilhelm was. He would challenge you like that and then give you an opportunity to prove him wrong. The next day I was in the starting lineup against the University of Illinois. I was three for four and scored the winning run in the bottom of the ninth and started every game the rest of my career, only because he gave me an opportunity. So that was different. To say that to a kid these days, to try and motivate them that way, here come the transfer portal. <laughs> so you got to be careful how you talk to kids because most kids, when they sign pro and leave here, if I were to tell every kid that signed pro when they left West Virginia, you don't have a chance. You're not good enough to make the big leagues. If I told them that, they would be so mad at me. They would hate me, but it would be the best thing for them. Because if you can do something every day – to prove people wrong, if that's your mentality when trying to do something, trying to prove to people how good you are at something, that quality will serve you well no matter what you do. But kids these days hate you for saying that. So you can't really, that's how this whole thing has changed over time. Can I challenge you to doing more chores around the house? Is that going to work? You well, can't do it, Maisie. You You're st- not good enough to vacuum. Well, you started the dishwasher at the beginning of this podcast, so they're almost done now. But no, that was a, you can't do that. It's not going to work on me. That's already worked once. Dang it. So I'm going to prove to you, you know, my first trick was 
the first time I did laundry, I put too much bleach in there and turned everything white. Correct. I did that on purpose. Oh, I know you. Yeah. I know you. Well, if you're going to do it like that, you're never doing laundry again. Oh, please, honey. I love doing... No, you're not doing laundry anymore. All right. (laughs) If you insist. Yep. Yep. That's how it rolls around the Maisie household. So good second episode. Little storytelling. We'll get into more of that next week. It's Let's, over already? Yeah, we're going to cut it off. We don't want to bore people too much. we got to make sure they get reeled in and want to stay tuned for the next week. I was just starting to have fun. That'd be cool if somebody doesn't find out about these podcasts till a year from now and they have to go back and binge listen <laughs> to them all at once. Yeah. Would that be fun for them, you think? <laughs> yeah. We're, we're bingers. We, we do that on occasion. We watch our uh, alone yep. uh, episodes. Uh, seven of them in a row. So that's a thing. The next podcast, we're going to talk about my story of my visit to the app store. Oh, that's a good one. A lot of people know that story. Not enough people know that story. So yes, that's a very good teaser for next week and a very true story that nobody's really going to believe. So thank you for joining us on this edition of Maisie Days. Looks like I'm going to go sweep or do something now. Yep. Yes, you are. And we'll be back next week. Thanks for listening, everyone. See you at Mondays.